Thank you for all, all of you being here. Uh, let's uh, have a short word of prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of life. And we pray, Father, for strength and encouragement to know that the Bible is reliable and see that we can build and anchor faith upon your holy word. Strengthen us, Father, to love your son and to love one another ever more so as the day approaches. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, today is the amazing story of Mount St. Helens. Uh, this coming Monday is the 40th anniversary, May 18th, 40th anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens. You might ask, why is this important? Well, the important thing is, like it says in Luke chapter 16, verse 29 to 31, Abraham said to him, we're talking about the rich man Lazarus, to the rich man, uh, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Then a rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will return. In other words, he's saying, But if someone was to come back alive from the dead, like resurrection, surely we'll believe them. Verse 31. But he said to them, No, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will be persuaded, even if one was raised from the dead and you know what i'm talking about jesus was raised from the dead and people didn't fall down on their knees and raise their hands and say hallelujah and praise the lord instead they kept finding a reason to discredit him to run away from god so we need to combat this situation every generation the war and battle must be fought over and over again every generation before the 18th century, there was a term called catastrophism. This was a biblical literalist view that all the geological features in the world that we see today were the result of the immediate effect and also the after effects of the great flood of Noah. Well, these are the ones who are biblical literalists and believe that the world was formed in October, I forget what's it, 10th at 8 a.m. at 4004 B.C. Well, uh, that is something that cannot be scientifically established. But it was the view even of scientists prior to the 18th century. Then the pendulum swung to the left. A thought called uniformitarianism with James Hutton and others and said that the key to the past is the present. If you want to know what happened a long time ago, study what's happening now. And he said that every geological feature no was not the result of Noah's flood, but occurred slowly that take uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, to millions of years to form. Like a tiny stream can grow into a mighty stream, into the mighty Colorado River. They can carve out the grandest of all canyon, the Grand Canyon, and the uh, uh, Arizona, the uh, Utah. But what do we observe? Have we ever observed an island forming rapidly? So the scientists said, no, no, we've never found an island forming rapidly. Of course, they take thousands and millions of years. Like, for example, Hawaii. As you see Hawaii, you see these little arrows here uh, from a fixed hot spot, and because of plate tectonics, it's migrating and forming Maui, Oahu, and uh, Kauai, the oldest, as things migrate from our lower right to our upper left here. And they say it took 4.6 million years to form these islands. They say, have we ever observed multiple layers or strata of rocks forming rapidly? They said, no, these are slow process. They say that the rock strata will form over successive periods of wet and drying as seas and oceans came in and then they came, uh, turned into deserts and then the seas uh, came in again, taking thousands or billions of years to occur. Have we ever observed a large canyon forming rapidly? Of course not. These biblical uh, people, these Christians are kind of Silly. They're kind of ignorant. They're not very scientific. 
they look at specimen bridge in Yellowstone National Park. You see these petrified logs hanging upright. And on the right, you see uh, a uh, profile cut of uh, specimen bridge. They believe you see these successive layers. They believe that there are 27 forests that formed and got buried and got formed and got buried and got formed and buried. And they represent 27, uh, see, different time periods, extending over millions and millions and millions of years. Of course, this is positive evidence uh, uh, that Christians are in error about what they believe. And of course, they say, the Grand Canyon, cut through by the Colorado River, taking millions of years. But there's a problem. In Science News Magazine, while I was teaching at Gabalino High School, I remember receiving this issue. Science News, the year 2000, September 30, erosion fast and fast. Within weeks later, I received another C magazine at Gabalino High School. Science World, The Mystery of the Grand Canyon. And it was a throwback to an article that came out in US News and World Report a little earlier. And it said that scientists used to say the Grand Canyon was 60 million years to form. Now, those of you old folks, meaning people like me, I remember when I was in high school, then teaching us that it, it may have taken over 100 million years to form the Grand Canyon. But then they said 60 million years. Then they said, oh, it, it could have occurred as fast as 40 million years, half the time we used to say. Then they said 20 million years. Then this issue of Science News says the current evidence is that it was a lot faster than we ever imagined. That it probably took only 5 million years, maybe less than 1 million years to form the Grand Canyon. Now, don't ask me how old the Grand Canyon is. I don't pretend to know. My personal belief is that the Earth is not as old as textbooks commonly teach, but I believe it's a lot older than a lot of biblical literalists believe. How old, I don't really know. It's not a salvation issue. But I do know that the historic Christian position, the position is taught by Jesus and others, imply that the Earth is probably on the younger side more than on the old side. How old? It will be presumptuous for me to say that I know, because unless you, the Bible spells it out, or unless it's spelled out by clear science, it's best for us to be open-minded. But now, after the May 18th, Mount St. Helen, the pendulum has swung back to the right. Now it's at the middle. A new term. Neo-catastrophism. Prior to this time, catastrophic geologists were not welcome at uh, international and national conferences of geology. But now they are welcome in view of what happened. The key to the past is not the present, it's the other way around. The key to the present is the past. Major geological events could have been formed by catastrophic events in a short period of time while others could have formed more slowly. Could islands form suddenly? Well, it was a front cover issue of Nas uh, National Geographic in 1963. Uh, Circe Island was 430 feet below sea level, erupted, sending a plume more than a mile high. Battleships, would be uh, like a tiny little dot on the picture to your left. And in three and a half years, it went from 430 feet below sea level to 509 feet above sea level and one square mile in size. And amazingly, in three and a half years, it had the flora and fauna of a mature island. Scientists were shocked. Scientists said that if they had not documented the formation of Circe Island, they would have said that these mature seashore cliff features were at least 800 to 1,000 years old, but they were only three and a half years old. So 
things can occur a lot faster than we think. Uh, Burlingame Canyon, Walla Walla, Washington. Look at a little picture on the left. You see that road, a little dirt road? That used to be where that canyon is. There was a dam, the water backed up, so a heavy rain, so it overflowed. The water overflowed was such a torrential, it wore out a lot of the soil support structure. There was a rupture, and in six days, six days, 120 feet deep, 120 feet long, 1,500 feet long, the Burlingame Canyon formed in six days. Not millions of years, not thousands of years of centuries, but six days. Here's Mount St. Helens before May 18, 1980. And of course, you saw the picture with me. That's how it looks today. So it would blow up its side. It, it did not blow lateral, I mean vertically, but laterally. Uh, it had to do with the uh, substructure. It was a weakness on the side. So when it blew, instead of blowing up straight up, let's say at 90 degrees, it blew at almost like at a 40, 30 to 45 degree angle. And it ruptured the entire side. And it careened down and flattened an entire forest with millions of trees where the barks were stripped off, all the branches were stripped off naked. And there you see Mount St. Helens today. It's a volcano within the volcano. It, uh, it last erupted, I think, in 2008. It still erupts occasionally, but nothing catastrophic like it was before. And look what occurred. It formed what's called the Miniature Grand Canyon. This Miniature Grand Canyon, one thirtieth the size of the Grand Canyon in one direction, one fortieth the size of the Grand Canyon in the other direction. Three canyons, one major and two side canyons formed. How long did that take? It took a matter of hours. Did you hear that? Hours. How many hours? nine hours to form. Let me explain this further here. You see down here, this little stream? Uh, Dr. Stephen Austin, who got his PhD in geology, uh, who one of the, at that time, one of the top five top schools of geology in the nation, said if we did not document the formation of of uh, the miniature Grand Canyon. We would have said that this tiny little stream trickle would have took 20 million years to form this canyon. You see, the river did not form the canyon. The canyon formed the stream. Because water seeks the lowest path after this uh, area was carved out by the eruption. Water from Harup found a path that trickles down as you see in the middle. Look at these three arrows. We're going to talk about that in just a moment here. On May 18th, okay, here you see a, a person standing in the middle for a comparison. Uh, this was from the Lahar, the Lahar meaning the lava flow that occurred on May 18th, 1980. This form at that time, carving out the area. On June 12th, less than a month later, <laughs> You had the formation of the pyroclastic blast. Uh, see, that just blew him. He says, if we were standing here at this day, at this time, uh, we would not be alive. It would have killed us. But we know it happened because scientists, when everything's quiet down, helicopters flew in, they set up cameras, they document the height. So we know for a fact that this. Uh, level was not beyond that red line up to that time. Then after the cloud uh, scattered, the helicopter brought them back and also they found this layer. This 25 layers of strata, which I'll show you in detail later, all formed in a matter of hours. And then, uh, let's see, less than two years later, the mud that flow into Sea Spirit Lake 
formed a plug, a dike that ruptured, and a wall of mud flowed and formed this top layer on March 19, 1982. Uh, total time for the last for all three, nine hours for the formation to occur. Here you see the swift lahar lahar layer, then the lava flow, the air blast, pyroclastic surge. These are all documented. Unlike prior scientific theories and textbook theories, which is based upon uh, ideas, but not based on actual empirical scientific observation. Mount St. Helen was the greatest geological lab of, in human history because for the first time we've actually documented scientifically with instrumentation, modern instrumentation, how things actually occur. And the National Park Service wrote, it changed our way of looking at things. Textbook had to be rewritten, but still at various national parks, they still teach the old traditional millions of years idea and theory. All right, here. Here you have the miniature Grand Canyon. See how, can you see how large it is? This all formed in a matter of hours as it was. And in the background here, is, this is Mount St. Helens, where my arrow is. It blew out the sky and it went into Spirit Lake. And you see these tree logs floating upright. What's the significance of this in here? The significance was that uh, we sent a uh, scuba diver and we were able to actually film these uh, floating upright. When they became waterlogged, they sank to the bottom and slowly got covered with mud. You see these different layers? You know how people will say, oh, it is one different time, it is another time, you're separate by millions of years. These layers are all the same time. They all occur at the same time. They're not millions of years of differences. So these were documented by scuba divers on film, where we actually see some of them, when they got more water logs, they actually could be visually seen sinking down and being buried and covered. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 6, above all, you must understand that in the last days, golfers will come golfing and follow their own evil desire. They will say, where is this coming of Christ that you promised about? Where is this? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on and has since the beginning of creation. Uniformitarianism. Uh, what you see happen now is what happened in the past. There was no beginning, there was no creation, there was no flood, there was no uh, resurrection. This is all supernatural myths are based upon ignorant Christians. Where is the so-called coming of Christ? It's been thousands of years now. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in its way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Now, here's some slides from a sermon that I gave a year ago. Challenge from what second. This is why, uh, see, Gabe and Richard, you have to understand, um, not everything in public high school textbooks are accurate. They are politically motivated to some extent. And some extent, there's censorship involved. For example, here, the National Center for Science Education, which is very anti Christian, Steve Newton, the policy director, wrote In support of their case, creationists point to the fact that most of the Paleozoic rock in the Grand Canyon are marine sediments, such as the Kaibab and Redwood limestone. 
creationists point to these rocks and rightly say that water is involved, that limestones form in the ocean. But the creationists suffer from one terrible, fatal flaw that Coconino sandstone. The Coconino sandstone is a desert deposit with records of sand dunes. They clearly display classic windblown features and so on. The Coconino sandstone sandwiched between rocks supposedly formed during the years of the flood, and yet it could only have formed on dry land. That proves that Christians are mistaken. That Coconino sandstone sticks in the eye of the creationist model. Is this really true? How will we answer this? Well, let's go to researchers who actually found it. This is what's referring. This is the Coconino sandstone formation. Supposedly a desert formation. And supposedly the layers below it and above it are limestone, clearly water deposit, because limestone form underwater. But how do you explain this so called desert formation? All right. But in this Coconino sandstone, supposedly from here to the top, it's 10 to 20 million years old. Uh, they found 238 fossil uh, foot tracks in nine locations. Fossil foot tracks of amphibians and aquatic reptiles. We could tell what species they are by the shape of their foot, their width and length and depth and so forth. They have been identified and published in referee scientific journals. The problem, this is what textbook teaches. They teach the theories of people who have not actually been there. Steve Newton, who teaches geology and oceanography at the college, has never studied the Coconino sandstone. When he's been asked about it, he said, have you ever visited it? He'll be honest, he's never actually been there. He's never actually studied it. And yet, he reads what other people who claim a uh, certain thing, but they studies have shown that he, the references that he looked at were by people who have never been there either. So they're going by hearsay. Let's examine a closer look. Let's look at people who actually studied it. Okay, by Loma Linda University, the Geoscience Research Institute. They have a staff of geophysicists and geologists and paleontologists that have actually went there and studied it firsthand. I met and talked to one of them, Dr. Elaine Kennedy, who's a PhD in geology from Colorado Schools of Mines and Jobs. She's been there in person and studied these things and said she can corroborate them. One, the location of fossil vertebrate footprints relative to the location of the bone fossils the nature and characteristic of the footprint and the angle of the sand dunes. What do they actually indicate? Well, look at this here. The funny thing, if we look at this uh, arrow on the left, the Coconino sandstone, 238 footprints. Why is it that not one bone, not one of those amphibians and reptiles have been found there, but they were found on the next layer above and two layers above. So how come the footprints are down here, the Coconino sandstone, but the bones of those same creatures are actually found above? Maybe they're not actually millions of years differences, tens and twenty of million years apart, but they're formed roughly at the same time. Okay, so how do we explain that? Okay. Also, these are the footprints found of Coconino Sound, formed in desert formation. Are you kidding? You guys know how desert form, you form, you can't make sharp imprint on desert sand. They fill in, they sink in. So what the uh, Loma Linda University Geoscience Research Institute did is that they had it published here, published in a referee of Dr. Leonard Brand. Professor Biden, Paleontology at Cornell, at Loma Linda, Doctor at Ben Cornell, published in the journal Geology. 
He got the flume tank at Loma Linda University and hot and obtained those species of amphibians and aquatic reptiles and with water flowing down the spoon tank, had them walk upright because one thing we know about those Coconino sandstone, all of the footprints were directional. They're all moving upstream. If this was a desert formation, random creatures walk in different directions, what are aquatic reptiles and amphibians doing in the desert? But instead, they were trying to escape something that happened to higher ground. The footprints were directional, they were all in one direction. And the footprints they made matched those. They matched those that were formed. And this is what they found out. That they most matched those of underwater sand, wet sand, damp sand, or dry sand. Damp sand and dry sand is what we expect from a desert formation. The Coconino sandstone, most represented by toe formation and sole impression, shape and depth, what is formed underwater sand, which will disprove on scientific experimental basis, published in geology magazine journal, on scientific experimentation, that a lot of evolutionary geologists don't have the facts straight. The facts seem to support that these were formed underwater. The Coconino sand was not a desert formation. That's why we have to be careful about what textbooks teach. Okay. But the following year, after a lot of people wrote to the editors of geology uh, with letters criticizing. Uh, hey, you know your article supports uh, a lot of Christian causes. Uh, the editor of John admits that Dr. Brand's work was groundbreaking and actually it was more comprehensive than any work done previously. Any. He's actually done more scientific experimentation than any previously done. But the editor of geologist, as an evolutionist, says, I give him credit. He based his work on science and experimentation. But he can't be right. It, it must be just made by some previously unidentified species of animal that has an unusual gait. So they're, they're arguing for the absence of evidence. We're arguing, Loma Linda and others, we're arguing on the basis of evidence, positive evidence, not negative evidence. And here's the article. Comment and reply on fossil vertebrate footprints in the Coconino sands of Crimea of Northern Arizona, evidence for underwater origin. Okay. While Bran and Tang, the two researchers at Loma Linda, are to be congratulated for a thorough experimental study which present more Coconino track data than have appeared at any time since the NRO study of Gilmore been, uh, 70 years earlier. So here he admits that Dr. Brand and Tang actually, they did their homework. Well, as a science teacher, let me tell you where I believe. I go with Loma Linda. They did the work. I don't know about you. All right. And they suggested that this argument that the uh, that some unusual creatures made it, well, it doesn't really seem to hold water. Okay. So they uh, find it unacceptable because it goes against the standard paradigm. How about the sand dunes? When you look at the cross cutting, cross bedding, all right, uh, see, the critics say that these were desert sand dunes. But when you look at the angle of the slope, the angle of the slope, desert sand dunes typically have a steep slope, 25 to 35 degrees. Whereas underwater sand dunes typically have a slope that's more gentle. Well, let me ask you, when you look at the actual angle of the cross bedding of the Coconino sandstone, where they steep, guess what? They're 30 degrees, all right? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, 
they were 20 degrees. Okay, was the average, which was actually more uh, like that of a submarine sand dune, not a desert sand dune. So when you look at all the evidence, the fossil bones, the fossil track, the sand dune shape, they all are arguments in favor. Three to zero, they were likely the form of the water, not desert formation. In US News and World Report, June 16, 1997, Geophysics of God. I'm going to stop here and give you, uh, share another screen. Don't know how many of you have seen this article, US News and World Report here. In this article here, it talks about this man's got his PhD in uh, geophysics from UCLA, his MS from Princeton University. By right. this man here is the author of Terra, the world's most powerful geophysics computer. He's at Caltech, the United States Geological Survey as well as the United States uh, Meteorological Survey. This man says that he believes that the flood of Noah caused, created the Grand Canyon. He says, why? When you feed the data into Terra, the world's most powerful supercomputer, it doesn't compute. We cannot generate the data that can form the Grand Canyon. But uh, Lake Missoula, we find, and the Lake uh, see Bonavent, uh, see Bonneville, we found some huge uh, dried up lake bed, 60 miles in diameter, uh, a fossil lake bed that, according to scientists, probably ruptured and caused a torrent of water that may have formed. Can this generate enough power to form? The flood of Noah, and Dr. Baumgartner says, "Para the supercomputer says, yes, it can." He mentions here that he was not a Christian; he was not raised as a Christian, so he's not seeking answer to corroborate his faith. He admits that he did not become a Christian until he was in graduate school at Princeton, when someone invited him to a Christian. He said he was an agnostic all his life. But he became uh, a Christian when he met Christian professors at Princeton University. But he said that when you look at uh, plate tectonics, moving at the power of um, at the Mid Atlantic Ridge, the divergement of moving a couple of centimeters uh, per year, that it doesn't generate enough power to lift to cause mountain upliftment like India forming uh, Nepal and the Himalayas and Mount Everest and all this here. But he fed information into Terra and said if it was an initial catastrophic event that ruptured the continental plate so that initially the continental plate drifted apart a few kilometers per year instead of a few centimeters. Um, and slowing down to the present rate could have generated enough power to uh, cause Mount Everest to lift up. 